Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to the show today. And you have reached America's slowest growing podcast. That's right. We have been voted the slowest growing podcast in America today. And with that being said, if you've yet to subscribe to our YouTube channel or you haven't subscribed to our podcast, wherever it is that you listen on podcast, I want to invite you to do so right now on YouTube. You just hit that red button and then hit the little bell and you'll get our notifications. Our podcast comes out every Friday afternoon, right about noon. And we would be delighted if you would join us right here each Friday at noon, whenever you want to really drop in for America's slowest growing podcast in the world. I, I couldn't be any more excited today uh, about my guest. When I was growing up, and I've said this before, all of my heroes were Bass Pros. And I mean that literally. I collect big league Bass Pro cards. I've got just about every Bassmaster episode from 1985 to the present on tape. It's an absolute sickness with me. But the guy that I geeked out the most was a guy that really kind of started his career uh, around my home area. Uh, and everybody used to call him the hippie. That's what they called him, the hippie. And then in uh, 1985, he started a TV show called Hank Parker Outdoors. That's right. Today, I have as my guest, the man, the fishing legend, Hank Parker. He's the only man in, in America to ever win the Grand Slam of bass fishing. He's won every single title at the time that Bassmaster had. Uh, 13 years of fishing Bassmaster, and he competed in 13 Bassmaster Classics. And he won two of them. And oh, by the way, somewhere in there, he won an angler of the year title and uh, was in the running for the greatest uh, Bass Pro of all time debate a few years back. And so I want you to stay tuned today. We're coming up and oh, did you listen to my new bumper music? I want a big, big shout out to Graham Griffin over in Fort Worth, Texas. He goes to my seminary, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. And he did our bumper music. We just added that kind of reposition the sign. We got a lot of stuff going here. So stay tuned. We've got the great Hank Parker coming up next on the Bass Chaplain Fishing Podcast. Hey, everybody, welcome back to America's slowest growing podcast. And I couldn't be any more geeked out today than I've ever been in my entire life. I've got a guy that I've watched my, my whole entire existence. Uh, one of the greatest bass fishermen that has ever lived, still one of the greatest bass fishermen that's ever lived, uh, Mr. Hank Parker. Welcome, Hank. Hey, we are so yeah. glad you're here. Hey, what a... What an intro, man. I, I like that. I need the, you to go with me everywhere and do my intro. That's awesome. <laughs> well, dude, you know, you were just, I was just listening to, to Pat Rennick's uh, Stray Cast with you on there. And he did a great job. And, and get me right. I listen to Pat all the time. But man, he, when he started, he said, I'm going to be your booking agent. I went, no, 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 no. Chris Wells <laughs> is his booking agent. I, I've got uh, Hank Parker more wild game banquets than anybody on the planet. And I just got you another one yesterday. I just did one over in Virginia. And, uh, and I said, um, I said, you really ought to have Hank Parker. This one, they had a thousand people there, uh, had over a hundred people except Christ. And I said, next year, y'all got to get Hank there. It's going to be awesome. So, that is so awesome, man. That's fantastic. Well, I'm excited, you know, to have you on here. And, and I got to tell you how this happened with me. Now I grew up on the Santee Cooper Reservoir. So I feel like We've got, I've always been one person away from you my whole entire life. Okay. <laughs> but, um, when I was a kid, I remember distinctly in 1979, uh, when you won the, the, the first classic, I was in the sportsman's corner that Joe Avens every day. I, that's what I did after school. We beeline to the sportsman's corner and that was the biggest tackle store I'd ever been in, in my life, you know, at the time. Uh, and it was so awesome in, in such a, a great place to hang out. Um, but they were in there talking, they were in there talking about you winning the Bassmasters classic. And I remember sitting there listening to Rusty Watson and Joe Avens and Doug Odom and all those guys. And they said, I said, man, Hank Parker used to be called a hippie, man. He was, they called him a hippie. <laughs> he had big old long hair. Was, is that the case? Were you the, 
Well, was that your nickname, the hippie, when you were down That's there? That's all they ever called me in uh, in Remini and Summerton and Sumter was hippie. I went by that. Uh, when I showed up at Santee Cooper for the first time, I had big old locks all the way back down to my belt. You know, I had the, I had the hippie hairdo. So, man, I was the hip. <laughs> that is awesome. That is an awesome deal. I remember uh, the first time I ever saw your spinnerbait. Uh, I went down to the boat ramp and Rusty Watson had that thing down and he was around the boat ramp. And I was like, that's Rusty Watson. He said, he said, yeah, Chris, come over here. He said, this is a new Hank Parker spinnerbait. And he caught two off the boat ramp at talk all with that spinnerbait. And I think I stood in line for about four hours to get that sucker one time. So it was, uh, it was really awesome, but man, what a great, what, what a great day. That is absolutely crazy. Well, I'm going to tell one story to start this thing off with, because, um, I think I've told you this before. I know you've got so many people you've talked to and you don't remember all these stories, but so a number of years ago, the church calls me up and, and they said, Chris, we want you, we've already got a speaker for our wild game. Back. We, we've got Hank Parker. They said, but we want you to introduce Hank Parker. And I said, man, I would love to introduce Hank Parker. I said, why do you want me to introduce him? And the guy said, because Hank fishes on the Bassmaster Tour and you're the Bass Chaplain. And I said, I said um, you realize that Hank retired in 1989, right? And he had no clue, no clue. So you're just as relevant today as you ever were. And, uh, and that, that's an awesome, awesome thing. But uh, I was listening to that uh, that deal with Pat the other day, and, and Pat was talking about all the old lures and stuff. And he started talking. You, you, you were talking about how fishing has changed. And uh, the Buck Perry spoon plug-in system. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Really I've well. got one right here. I've got that. That's how geek night out I am. I've got a Buck Perry spoon right here. I knew that's exactly it. what you were talking about. And I pulled out all my stuff. I've got all my, my Hank Parker card Ooh, right here. Good to go. And, and this one, this is the St. John's River patch. I'm a patch geek as well. Okay. And, uh, this is 1978 uh, Florida Invitational. Uh, St. John's River. Old, I don't know if you remember old Doug Odom or not, but Doug oh, Odom yeah, gave me Doug that. Real well. And uh, the first Bassmaster tournament I ever went to was 1976, and and Doug Odom led the tournament the whole day. Ended up losing to Jimmy Houston on the last day of the tournament. And I, I told my my dad, I said, Dad, why don't we go fish with Doug Odom? He said, Son, you better stay away from Doug Odom your entire life. That's what he said. <laughs> and I've had so many people say that, but like 25 years later, Doug walks into my church and gets saved, and um, and uh, God's just used him in powerful ways. And and when he gave me these patches, he gave it to me on the day that he threw away all of his trophies except for his Bassmaster trophies. He uh he piled them in the back of a pickup truck and drove them to the dump. And he said, I'm through with all the trophies. He said, Jesus has changed my whole life and threw them all in there. So it was a pretty awesome deal. And so anyway, that I is wild. I want to that share that wild. with you. That was pretty cool, man. He was a, <laughs> he was a stud on Santee down there and still is. He still is. Oh He's yeah. There was no doubt he was. Now I hadn't fished there in a while, so I don't know what's going on at Santee anymore. I'm sure he's in the hatchery, but I mean, in the pastures tomorrow down there, but Hey, I wanted to talk to you about the, the old days of, of BASS. What, what was it like when you, when you first got in there and, and man, you, you, uh, you hit the big time, you're in the Bassmaster, uh, trail and you're fishing several different trails at the time, I believe. And, um, what, what was it like back then? What, what, how, how did, how did all that get started? Tell us how you got started doing that. Well, you know, when I first started, I had an overrated boat. Bass had a, uh, a cutoff of 150 horsepower. And when I started the first, uh, I, I traded up and uh, my boat was illegal. I had a TR Ranger at the time and it had a 140 on it. And it, I know it had a 150, but it was only rated for a 140. So it was illegal for bass. And then uh, I got a, um, uh, a pad boat, a 1776 Ranger. And I put a 175 Black Max on it. So I was illegal for bass uh, <laughs> because I exceeded the horsepower. So I fished national bass, American bass, and uh, uh, wanted to fish bass, but just couldn't afford to get a new boat. And I won angler of the year for, Amer uh, for national bass. And part of my winnings was a Hirsch bass boat. And uh, they paid all my entry fees. And so I, I, I 
worked around that and I got a deal with Hydra Sport for one year. And uh, I've always, every, I've owned a Ranger my whole life and I was a big Ranger guy. I ended up running that boat and it was miserable. It was just not what, it didn't meet what my standards were. So that next year I won Angler of the Year and I got the prize for the Hearst boat and all my entry fees paid. And I saw Forrest Wood and Forrest congratulated me. He said, man, two years in a row, you're Angler of the Year. I said, well, Forrest is bittersweet. He said, now, how could it be bittersweet, Hank? <laughs> I said, well, I'm a ranger guy. And I said, I want a Hearst bass boat and all my entry fees paid. And I want a ranger. He said, well, tell me what they're doing for you again. I said, well, they're giving me a boat for the year. And at the end of the year, I turn it back in and they're paying all my entry fees. He said, well, we can do that at Ranger." Wow. I said, you're kidding. He said, no, we'll do that. So I did a handshake deal with Forrest Wood and I, I got a Ranger boat with a 150 on it and I started fishing bass. And man, after fishing the other tournaments, it was so professional on the bass side. I mean, everything, there was no absolute, no favoritism. It was exactly the way it should have been. No matter who you are, whether you were Bill Dance or Tom Mann or Roland Martin or Ricky Klon, there was no favoritism. When I came into the sport, a rookie, I had just the same level playing field that they had. And you could see the professionalism versus where I had come from. Mm. So it was just so cool to know that you're in an organization that is ironclad set on rules and you're going to go out and compete on a level playing field and i finished the first year i made the classic in 78 i fished uh the classic and had a good chance to do really well i finished in a top 10 but i i could have won that thing bobby murray ended up winning and running basically the same pattern that i was running but he executed perfect and i did not so he won the very first classic of the uh, BASS in 71 on Lake Mead. And then he won the 78 classic on uh, Ross Barnett and he retired. A lot of people mm. say, well, yeah. you're the only guy that ever retired after winning the classic. No, no. My hero, Bobby Murray, he won the fat first classic in 71. He won again in 78 and he retired after winning the 78 classic. Bobby Murray was an absolute hammer. He's probably one of the most underrated fishermen in the entire sport. He was an absolute hammer. I remember, I remember Doug talking about him and, and, and all the early guys. Do so you remember your first tournament? What was like the first time you entered a, a Bassmaster event? What, what do you remember where that was and what happened? In oh yeah. Tournament? I remember really well. I had, uh, I was with a group of guys that went to Cuba. And Ray Scott was so against that. Ray was so against it. Well, I had to fly from uh, uh, Havana to uh, to Orlando to come to the tournament that uh, the first tournament that I ever fished uh, was on the Kissimmee chain. And uh, so I was at that first tournament and Ray knew that Billy Westmoreland and I had gone to, uh, to Cuba. So he was really down on that. And so when he called out my name, I said, here, and he just stopped. Everybody else, when he called out their name, they would reply here, and he would go on down the list. He didn't stop and look or do anything. Uh, Ray had never met me at that time. I talked to him on the phone, but we had never met. And when he called my name and I said, here, he just stopped and he had his reading glasses on. He pulled those glasses off and he made eye contact with me as I was sitting in the bleachers at a high school where we were having our pairings meeting. And he stared at me for, it seemed like two hours. It was probably about 10 seconds, but he made certain he knew who I was <laughs> and he let me know that he wasn't real happy with me. So that, that was the first uh, tournament I ever fished and was on Kissimmee. And I think I finished like eight or ninth in that tournament. Wow. I had a really good tournament. David Gleeby ended up winning it, but it was awesome. And Dave that was, Gleeby, that was wow. 
Wow. <laughs> now, that had to be intimidating. Well, now, let me ask you this. Why did you go to Cuba, man? What was the deal going to Cuba? It was did the you... best bass fishery in the whole wide world. It's really? just incredible. It's incredible. And I had seen these movies about Treasure Island, and we got to fish there. There's this big old dragonfly every night that flies over the water uh, about dark, 30 minutes in, in, into the twilight. And uh, these bass jump out of the water and catch these, uh, these fish in mid, these uh, dragonflies in midair. And uh, I saw that, and I was just about to go out of my mind to get to go. And then when I got the invitation, I went and... Uh, it was. It lived up to its uh, height. It was awesome. It was. Y'all caught some good ones there, is what you're saying. Oh, it was Cuba. crazy. I went three years. I ended up going for three years, and then we had a Cuba versus America bass tournament. Then the Cubans came and fished with us at Lake Conroe. Uh, right. About uh, oh, I don't know. That was probably about 1981. Wow, I I had no idea that. Uh, yeah, it was pretty. I, cool. I didn't know you could get into Cuba back then. That that's pretty. Well, impressive you couldn't. Right there. You couldn't. We were the first group we were the first group of americans that went to cuba legally since the bay of pig deal so wow. uh, it was a pretty pretty adventurous little uh fishing trip to say the least that is that is just crazy i know i bet ray scott was pretty intimidating when he wanted to be i bet because i know how you know we just uh trip weldon just retired and i got a chance to work with trip for about 14 years you know with bass messing and trip trip's a little guy but that dude, that dude can hold his own with anybody. Oh, and I know yeah. he learned all this stuff from Ray Scott. And so I, oh, bet, yeah. I bet Ray was tough. Yeah, I'll that. tell you a story about Ray. You know, Chris, when I got saved, my dad was an alcoholic. Right. And my dad, my dad got saved and uh, he quit drinking. And he, he witnessed to me for five years. And my dad was killed in an automobile accident. Well, I got saved at my dad's funeral. Right. And, uh, this was before I ever started fishing the tournaments. This was in 75. And, uh, I, my dad was a good guy and he had one vice. He liked a good cold beer and that good cold beer led to multiple cold beers, to hard liquor. And I watched it transform the greatest dad in the whole wide world to the sorriest dad in the whole wide world. So I hated alcohol and, uh, the Bassmaster Classic was sponsored by Miller High Life. And Miller High Life was on the side of the boats in uh, 1977. Ricky Clun won the tournament uh, down at Kissimmee. And so in 1978, I qualified for the Bassmaster Classic and I sat through uh, the whole classic meeting. And when it was all over and everybody left, uh, I went up to Ray and I said, Ray, I really appreciate everything you guys are doing. This is the greatest tournament organization in the world. I said, but Ray, I'm not going to go to the classic. He said, you what? Nobody. He said, there's one guy the very first year that didn't go. And nobody's ever not gone since that time. He said, what's wrong? I said, well, Ray, I got saved. Mm -hmm. And I said, I hate alcohol. And I said, I can't in my heart endorse alcohol and represent my savior. I said, I am no longer my own. I've been bought with a price. I belong to Jesus Christ and I'm going to serve him. And I'm, I'm not going, I'm not going to fish with a Miller high life sticker on my boat. And he started laughing. He said, Hey, Miller's out. There ain't going to be no <laughs> signage. Miller's There's gone. no beer company. He put his arm around me and he said, I appreciate that. I appreciate your stand but you come on and you fish this classic. How awesome and he was, was wow. It, it, I saw a different side of Ray. Uh, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't, he was humbled by that. And that really blessed me that he cared and he, he genuinely cared about that. And that made an impact on him that uh, somebody would make a stand. And I, I appreciated, appreciated Ray and saw him differently than I'd ever seen him in the year that I'd fished. So it, it was completely a different race, Scott. So I got to know another side of it. Well, that's pretty wild. Well, let me tell you, you know, when you were talking to, you were talking to old Pat before, Pat was asking you about your faith and how calm, you know, you were on the water and things like that. And at the end of that deal, he said, now we're not going to get into all of that, you know, 
But today we're going to get into all of that. We're going to get it. That's the purpose. One of the reasons that I wanted to do a podcast at all was because uh, I see there's a lot, there's a tons of podcasts about fishing. There's a tons of podcasts about faith, but I wanted to connect the two. I wanted the two to, to hook up oh, yeah. and just say where faith and fishing hook up. So I'm going to ask you some more fishing questions a little bit, but I want to let you tell your testimony. And before you tell your testimony, I want to share with you this. I don't know if I ever tell you this or not, but I had a family member and we were fishing together one time. This was back. He, he, he was the first guy in my, in my family that had a real bass boat. And, um, we were out fishing and he said, Chris, um, if you could fish with any pro, who would you fish with? We were, we must've been in high school or like that. And he said, he said, man, I, I love to fish with Hank Parker. Well, I remember that all those years. Well, years later, I ended up meeting Terry Chupp. And, uh, and Terry oh, yeah. Chupp, you know, led a lot of my friends to Christ and stuff. But he, I told him that story. And he said, well, you know what? You're probably not going to be able to fish with Hank and get him in the boat. But he'd go, here's a cassette tape of Hank's testimony. Why don't you give him that, that cassette tape? And he got saved by listening to Hank Parker's testimony on cassette tape. And so, Hank, if you would, I would love for you to tell everybody, all of our listeners, about how you came to know Jesus. Well, Chris, I'll tell you, about 10 days or two weeks ago, the Lord really laid on my heart to tell the whole story. I had never really told the whole story. I talked about my dad becoming an alcoholic and how my life became chaotic. And a lot of... of the influence that my dad had as being a drunk, you know, Forrest Gump said life like a box of chocolate, but a drunk really like a box of chocolate. You never know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And my dad would come home violent. He would come home uh, angry and wouldn't come home at all. He wouldn't, he, he, he may not have a paycheck when he came home on Friday and, and we'd have no groceries. And uh, as a kid, you know, I've always said kids should never have to worry about the power company pulling the meter off the side of the house and you'd be sitting in the dark and cold or a kid should never have to worry about whether he's going to have something to eat or not, uh, at least not in America. And that was my life. Hmm. And so it made it sound as if I turned into a bad guy because of the influence of a drunken father, but I had already become a bad guy in my heart, when I was just a little kid, I'd steal things. And, and I, I had a lot of anger issues before my dad became alcoholic. But when my dad became alcoholic, our life was total chaos. And I had never told this before until uh, uh, like two weeks ago. And it's a very difficult place for me to go, but it's who I am. It's not who I am. Let me correct that. It's who I was. Mm -hmm. And I grew up dyslexic. When I was a kid, wow. they didn't even know what dyslexia was. I went to a little school in Maiden, North Carolina, and no one had ever heard of dyslexia, nor myself. My mother would read with me, and she would read a passage in a book and ask me to read it behind her, and I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And my mom would look at me, and she said, how can you be so stupid? that you can't read that. I just read that. You read that. And I'm not blaming my mom, and I don't want her to look bad. I can only imagine how frustrated she was knowing nothing at all about dyslexia. But the harder I tried, the more backwards words became. And I could just never read them in sync. I would look at the word backwards. And when I was in the second grade, uh, we had a, a teacher named Miss May, and she wanted me to write dog on the chalkboard. And I really wanted to do it right. And I was in front of the whole class and I wrote God. Wow. Dog backwards. And she thought that I was being purposely sacrilegious and it offended her. And I understand that. And so she said, I'm going to give you one more chance and you better get it right. And I, I tried so hard and I wrote it backwards, which was God. And she beat me unmercifully. They did put her in prison, mm. but she beat me to the point that I cried in front of the class and I peed in my pants. And you know how kids are. They made so much fun of me mm. and I shut down. That, that was the end of my trying in school. 
So when I was 17 years old, I had a U.S. history teacher uh, ask me to stay after school. And my dad used to tell me all the time, he said, you're stupid. You're the dumbest kid I've ever seen. You're nothing. You're absolutely nothing. My mom would say, how can you be so stupid? I couldn't read. I'm 17 years old and I cannot read. Uh, everything I look at is backwards. And I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I just think I'm stupid. My whole life, I've been told by everybody that I'm stupid. So I'm 17 years old and my US history teacher, a black lady, we had just been segregated for, uh, for two years. Uh, we, we had just been integrated. We had been segregated my whole yeah. life. Mm -hmm. And so integration took place two years prior to that. So growing up in the South, I'd always heard black people were bad. Mm -hmm. Well, I met black kids that were just like white kids. Right. Yeah. Oscar Maddox was a little black guy that became my best friend in the whole wide world. If you said something about Oscar, I'd bite you. I mm -hmm. loved him. Yeah. And he was just a super kid. Well, that I'm a confused guy now. Wait a minute. All this, this ain't bad. Well, this Miss Pope asked me to stay after school. She asked me some questions and she said, let me tell you something. You got that right. But on your test, you got that wrong. You cannot read. I said, yes, ma'am, I can read. I was very embarrassed. Now I'm 17 years old. And she said, you cannot read. I said, yes, ma'am, I can read. I just don't, I, I just not comfortable. She said, no, read that to me. Read that question to me. I said, well, now I don't read in public. She said, no, you don't. And you don't read in private either because you cannot read. And she grabbed me by my face. Mm. Tears rolling down her eyes. She looked at me and she said, you're smart. You're so smart. She said, I look on your records and not one of your teachers had written wow. on here that they suspected that you couldn't read. You've ran that bluff. You are smart. I've never been told that by anybody. I was smart. But I had such bitterness and I had such hate and I was so full of confusion and I thought I was the dumbest guy in the world. And I just couldn't sort it all out. Well, Miss Pope kind of recognized my problem. But that was embarrassing. And I knew that word was going to get out. I couldn't deal with that. So I quit school. I quit school. Well, then my life at home was chaotic. My dad was a drunk. Uh, I'm a high school dropout. I have nothing at all going. And my dad gets saved. When my dad got saved, it was the difference between night and day. I mean, it, it was a miracle. It was amazing. It, it, he went from being the worst guy right back to him old self, he, even better. And my dad was on fire for Jesus. So he started witnessing yeah. to me. Well, here I am, a high school dropout with nothing going for me, but I had way too much pride to accept Jesus. Right. Yeah. I'm right in the middle of Hale's theme song. I did it my way. And, and that was it, man. I, I'm going to live my life. So here I am, a high school dropout, confused, full of anger, bitter. I didn't think it was fair that my cousins, they had everything. I had nothing. Their dads were sober. My dad had been a drunk. I just felt like God had cheated me. The whole world was unfair. I didn't get, I, I was a victim. And I played the role of the victim in my heart. And I was just full of bitterness. And I got my mind on fishing professionally. And so that was my goal. And my dad used to quote to me, Matthew 16, 26, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? And my dad would read it to me, Hank, what would you have if you won every bass tournament in the world and died and went to hell? Mm. That used to drive me crazy. Yeah. And so as time went on, I wouldn't talk to my dad anymore. Uh, I'd made up my mind. You know, the gospel of Jesus Christ will make you mad, sad, or glad, but it won't leave you neutral. That's right. You got to deal with it. So here's this kid full of bitterness, full of anger, confused, proud, and my dad's so humble. My dad's so bad wanting me to get saved. And man, I don't want to deal with it anymore. I don't, I don't want to deal with it. 
And he would quote all the scripture and it make me feel uncomfortable because the word of God is much like a mirror. And I didn't like what I saw. Yeah. And I knew I was lost, but I wouldn't admit it for nothing. He had asked me from time to time when I quit talking to him, he said, son, are you happy? When, he, when you lay down at night and it's just you and God, do you have peace in your heart? And I'd lie like a dog. I'd say, man, yeah. No, I didn't. I, I was empty. Well, time went on. I began to fish. I started winning. I probably won more money in a, in a single year than he, in one tournament than he made the whole year. And, but I still was not happy. There was something missing. Well, my dad, uh, he put gospel tracks because I wouldn't talk to him anymore. I'd be somewhere at four o'clock in the morning putting my socks on. I said, what is in my sock? <laughs> It'd be a gospel track. And, and he'd leave them anywhere he thought I could read them. God's simple plan of salvation. You must be born again. Man, I didn't want to hear that. Well, my dad was killed in an automobile accident, and he left a note in his Bible for his pastor not to pre preach a traditional funeral for him, but to preach the gospel that he had two sons that were lost, me and my brother. And uh, I got saved at my dad's funeral. Wow. I know what that peace was he was asking me about that I lied about. I didn't even know what peace was. In my heart, you're talking about chaos. Chaos was when I would get caught in an electrical storm out fishing. Man, if one of those bolts of lightning hit me, I'd be in hell, and I knew that. Mm. But when I got saved, all that was gone. You were 47 years ago. <laughs> wow. And I have a piece that uh, I completely understand, and I had no idea what that was all about, but I do now. <laughs> Man, Hank, you, I was going to ask you that same thing because at the game banquet that I spoke at this weekend, I quoted you the gospel will make you mad, sad, or glad. Talk about Amen. that for a second. Talk about what, know, what does that mean? What, what, tell you know, I've, I've so many of these guys I see on the tournament trail and stuff, and and you know, I, I really can testify that that's true. The gospel either makes people mad, it either makes people sad, or it makes people glad. That is that is the most profound thing I've, I think I've ever heard. It really is. That well, is awesome. I, my my uh, my dad's pastor said that at my dad's funeral. And I've never forgotten that. And uh, so I have to give Grady Parker the credit for that. that Grady I, Parker. I, I've quoted him a hundred thousand times, but he's the one that came up with that. And it's so true because the gospel is alive. The Bible, you know, you don't hear a lot about Chris that they want to get rid of the Quran or they're trying to get rid right. of Buddhism or the, cause it doesn't matter. It's just words. It don't do anything to you. Right. You can read, you can read it and it doesn't affect you any more than Shakespeare affects you. It, it doesn't affect you any more than the funny papers, Right. but the, the Bible is the living word of God mm. and it is so alive and the Holy spirit is real. Right. And when that word hits you, it demeans humanity. It demeans, it shows our inferiority. It mm. shows our weakness. It shows our depravity, it shows our sinful nature, and we don't like that. Mm, that's right. So the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. And when it is read to you, you might try to just brush it off and pretend that it didn't affect you, but it gives you an ultimatum whether you like it mm. or whether you don't like it. It if somebody says, well, I don't like it and I don't believe it. Well, regardless of whether you like it or regardless of whether you believe it, the truth still remains. Mm -hmm. It's still the living word of God. And I didn't like it right? because yeah. it showed me that I couldn't do it on my own. It showed me that I was inferior. It showed me that I had no hope outside of Jesus Christ. Right. I didn't like that. So I ran from that. But there are people that see that and they know that, but yet they refuse. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. He's not going to knock the door down. You've got to answer his call. And there's people like the rich man in the Bible that said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and follow me. And he went away sad because he knew the truth, but he wasn't willing to give up his lifestyle yeah. 
in order to receive it. And, and there's people like that. I meet them all the time that, man, they know that's the truth. They know they need God for salvation. They know that Jesus died for them, but they won't accept them because they don't want to give up what they have. Mm -hmm. And that makes you sad. They leave sad. Uh, and then there's those who are mad in the beginning. And Second Peter 3, 9 says that the Lord is not slack as some count slackness, but is long suffering, mm -hmm. not willing that any yeah. should perish, but all come to repentance. Right. Yeah. And he was, he was patient with me. And so when I came to repentance, I went from mad to glad. <laughs> wow. Wow, man, what a, that's a, what an awesome testimony. Hey, let me, I know you speak at game banquets all over the country. I be, I was riding the other day uh, somewhere, and I think I passed three churches, and all of them are having Hank Parker for the, for the I was like, wow. What do you, what do you say to people at the end? If, if there's a guy that's a fisherman, he might be on the Bassmaster Series, he might be on Major League Fishing, you know, he might just be the weekend angler that uh, just loves it so much. Uh, to receive Christ, what do you do to tell people? What, what do they got to do? What, what, what do you got to do to to have that peace and assurance in your life? You know, I, I tell everybody, uh, there's so many people that are good people. I was not a good person. I was a, I was a, and I knew it, man. I was a hellion and uh, I was, I, I, I was bad. There are people that are really good people. They're nice. They give, they care about other people. And, uh, those are the hardest people to reach because somehow they think that their goodness gives them merit to be saved. Yeah. And God makes it really clear in his Bible on uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that right. not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And it's hard for people to accept that, that are good nature because they look at me. They look at me and they say, well, I'm a lot better than you. Well, you're right. But being better than me will not get you into heaven. Uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart uh, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That heart and believing in your heart, a lot of people may say, well, I got saved one time. Uh, the preacher asked me to raise my hand, and I did. Right. Well, did you have a change of heart? Yeah. Did you really have a, a repentant heart and called on Jesus and confessed to him that you needed him to cover your sins with his blood that he shed on Calvary? Did you really mean that, and have you had a change? Mm -hmm. So many people just praying with your lips, the, the, the devil believes that there is right. uh, a God. He, he knows that Jesus is real right. and he may confess that, but until he says, I am lost, I am a sinner. I repent. I ask Jesus to cover my sin. I make him Lord of my life till mm. you do that. And so I tell that I go over that regardless of how good you are, regardless of how faithful you've been to your community, to your church. Right. You know, the Bible says that there will be people that stand before Jesus and say, Lord, did I not do many wonderful works in your name? Did I not cast out demons in your name? And he's going to look at them and say, depart. I never knew you. And I don't think he's going to say that, Chris. I don't think he's going to say that angry. I don't think he's going to say that harsh. I think he's going to say that with a broken heart. He's going to say, man, I wanted to know. I came to you, man. I sent people. I died on the cross for you, man. I loved you. I wanted you, but you were too proud. You were too pride, too prideful to come to me. Depart. I never knew. You. And so I try to always explain that it ain't about being good. It ain't about uh, uh, following some instructions. It's about coming to Jesus under his terms mm. and asking him to come into your heart. And we all have things that are on our mind. We all have things that we prioritize, but like the rich young ruler, for example, how important is his money going to be? How important is it today? That was 2000 yeah. years ago. Yeah. 
So now what's he got? That's right. Yeah. You know, He's so we got all this stuff on our mind. Yeah. 2,000 years from now, how important. But what you do with Jesus is going to be just as important 2,000 years from now or 2 million years from now that it is today. That is so awesome, man. Hank, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you using the platform that God gives you. There are so many guys I see, and, and I've talked to every Bassmaster Elite Series guy, every Major League Vision guy, and, uh, and, and they, they, a lot of guys think about, it's all about just, you know, the, the world stuff. It's all about, I appreciate you using your platform to bring glory to God. And, and what an awesome, awesome testimony. I thank you for sharing that, you know, with us today. If you read, if you read all my, my promo sheet, my acclimates, whatever you want to call yeah. it, and you read the whole Hank Parker story, it's impressive. But let's go back and think about that kid, that, kid. that was dyslexic, that's right. 17 yeah. years old, couldn't read. Yeah, that's right. Quit school, had nothing going for him. The people in my community said, I'm going to tell you something. Part of that family's good, but them Parkers, they're trash. Mm. They're trash. And they're right. I was trash, and I deserve that title. But I thank God that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords left his throne in glory to come down to this earth and pick up trash mm. and recycle it. And so when you read that acclamé about Hank Parker, that's the one that had been touched by the master. Mm. So I don't have anything to do, Chris, but to brag on what Jesus did because I'm that same kid mm. had it not been for Jesus Christ changing my life and putting me in the position to bless me and I don't deserve anything. And I want to make sure as you read the acclimates of Hank Parker, that you realize that he is who he is because of the grace of Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. That's right. That's exactly right. You know, if you're listening to this podcast right now, and I hope, I believe that, that many, many people are going to listen to it. If, even in the stillness of these moments, if you feel the Holy spirit drawing you, call to him, call to him. A lot of people think they got to clean up to, to get right with God. You can't clean up. You can't do it on your own. You come to him just like you are. You bring your sin, you bring everything. And, uh, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, a, a young boy that thinks he's got nothing going on, or you think you're the greatest guy in the world. Let me tell you, Jesus can take you from where you are and make you exactly brand spanking new. Amen. 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 Awesome. Yeah, I hope, I hope many people at the end of this deal, um, we're going to put a little uh, excerpt up there. And if you're somebody who needs to know Jesus, uh, you can call me anytime, day or night. That's why God put me on the planet to tell people how they can know for certain if they were to die, they go to be with Jesus. And that's a, what an awesome testimony, man. I appreciate you sharing that with me. Well, we're going to do something now that, um, that, that has become a fan favorite on the bass chaplain fishing podcast. And, uh, I hope I'm, I'm not springing this on you too bad. I, I think I mentioned it in Miss Martha uh, before, but we, we like to do impressions here. You know, impressions are like the greatest form of flattery when you're imita imitation is the, is the greatest form of flattery. And, uh, and we've had pros uh, imitate other pros and do some great impressions. You know, um, I was hoping you would kind of do Roland Martin for us or one of those guys uh, for us today. But, uh, but if you got an impression you could do of another Bass Pro, who you – I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you history. This is history. Roland Martin fished with a guy from Texas in Cuba. Wow. He had never used the term son. And this guy <laughs> from Texas, everything he would say, he had a ton, let me tell you, son, every time he'd catch a fish. So – when Roland left Cuba, every time he'd catch a fish, he'd son, let me tell you what. Oh, oh man. That's where that was. That's birthed. the origin of son. Good that night. is where that son. came from. So when you <laughs> think of awesome. Roland Martin, you think son. That's it. That's a good one right there. That's a good one, son. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Hank, you know, we, uh, we, we want to give our listeners uh, a little something, you know, it, how is bass fishing? I mean, I thought about your life. I think about my life and I think about how bass fishing has changed. What is the, you have seen bass fishing change 
change exponentially. I mean, you've gone from like we talked, well, you know, what you and Pat talked about, the spoon plug to hey, be able man. to find the hump, <laughs> to be able to look on your screen and see fish. Oh, there's a catfish by that tree right there. Tell, how, how, I mean, that, that must be amazing. You know, you've seen it all as far as that goes. It, it, it really is. And, you know, the older you get, the more you tend, or me at least, let me speak in, in my term, uh, to resist change. Right. Uh, yeah. You like it the way it is. Uh, and you don't want to be interrupted with a bunch of new technology or changes. But I can honestly say about 10 or 12 years ago, I really took a change of heart. And uh, when side imaging came out, it was so radically different and it changed everything. Well, now here we go with Mega Live. And so everything is changing all over again. And it's so much innovation and it's almost an overload. So what I have tried to do is step back, accept it as a challenge let's learn this new technology let's have fun doing it and let's don't try to let it intimidate us and uh, the old way is not uh, not the best way if there's some innovative uh, things that will help you catch fish so my whole life in bass fishing my philosophy was 99 is not a good number if 100 is achievable. So don't you slack off and then blame it on something else. If you give it 100% every single time, then that's the best you can do. Win or lose, you walk away complete because you did everything you could do. Well, that's the same approach that I'm taking today with all this new technology. Don't get complacent and be intimidated. Uh, or or be defensive about all the innovation because it is all a part of helping us catch fish. And for me, the challenge is I want to pass this on to these high school guys. Mm, yeah. So I want to be up on the cutting edge of everything that's going on to be able to benefit people to, to help them catch more fish. And whether we like it or whether we don't, because of these things right here, yeah. kids are so much more impatient right instant yeah. gratification man they can play games on their phone they can ha ask siri they can do anything that they want to do and find that information so we need to be able to help these fish these kids catch fish quicker mm. uh and, and to be <laughs> able to be more successful to keep them engaged in the sport itself so all this new technology is a challenge and it really goes against my old nature because I don't want right. change, but I've embraced it. And now I accept it as a challenge. So, hey, I want to learn everything I can learn. I was going to ask you to give some fishing tips. That's the greatest fishing tip I've heard this <laughs> year. I mean, that that's amazing right there. I mean, how in the world? I'm, I'm praying I can get that type of mentality because I listen to guys and we sit around, all my cronies sit around and go, I can't believe we got all this live scope, live imaging, stuff like that. And we need to, we need to do tournaments where they ban that and stuff like that, but to come out and embrace it, that, that, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome that you got a chance to, uh, you know, to, to think like that. I'm impressed. I'm impressed again by all that. Well, may I tell you what? So, uh, if you wanted to give, if you had to give just a quick couple of things that, a, that an average guy can do to get better, what, what would you say? that uh, just, just give us a couple of things, whatever we can do to, to try to get a little bit better as fishermen uh, that you've seen over the years. Well, the one thing that I made up my mind back in the old days when I fished with somebody, no matter who I fished with, I was going to learn something from them. A lot of times we come prideful and we think, hey, man, I'm a world champion. You ain't telling me nothing. Hey, I want to learn from everybody I fish with. And I fish with these high school kids today, and yeah. I take that on as a part of helping and giving back to this sport. But in reality, I've learned a lot from these high school kids. Yeah. And it's amazing if you'll set your mind to trying to learn. I watch Bill Dance on television. I still learn things from Bill Dance. Right. He's a master at teaching. And I think it's really important to maintain that open mind and to realize that every single day, if you're going to be better, you need to learn something new because the sport is evolving and it's changing 
fish are getting harder to catch and uh, it's a challenge uh, just to keep up. But if you don't, you're going to get left behind. So uh, all that information out there and tips, never get too proud to learn from somebody that may not have uh, the credentials that you have, or you may not have the same respect for their ability, but I guarantee you, they can teach you something if you're willing to be taught. Oh, that's awesome. That's good stuff right there. You know, I've, I've got this question that's kind of staged out. I want to ask you this. You have fished with some pretty amazing people in your life. You fished with Larry Bird one time. Is that right? You had Larry Bird. Bo Jackson was on your show one time. I mean, How about that. Good night. I mean, it, I mean, Dale Earnhardt, you fish. Who is the most interesting person you've ever fished with? Who, who, who is the person you said, well, I, I heard you tell about junior samples one time and, you know, breaking out the buffet on the back of the boat and things like that. But who, who was, I mean, I, I'd just be interested to know who, who was the, who's the guy that you thought was the most interesting. Well, you can take Bird and Bo Jackson and Earnhardt and you can put them all in, uh, all in one nutshell. These guys were the best of the best of their sport, and they didn't like to lose at anything. And Bird, when he got in my boat, Bird honestly thought he was going to beat me. Uh, Bo totally, absolutely intended to beat me. Uh, and Earnhardt, uh, it was a slam dunk with him. He was the intimidator, and he's going to win. And I had so much fun. Bird, uh, Earnhardt, you had to be real careful with Earnhardt, not get too far ahead of him. I fished him about 10 times. Uh, if you got too far ahead of him, he'd quit. He just, <laughs> he'd he'd just crash. He's just crashed. Boom. He's gone. He's yeah. out. He's blowing the engine. To wait till the last hour and then just lay it on him. Oh, it was hilarious. But Bird, I fished with Bird and I was in a private lake in Georgia and I figured these fish out before he got there. And I told him, I said, Larry, let me tell you, there's a trick to this. This wind's blowing a little bit. But the, the, the tornado came through here, and there's a bunch of trees down, and there's root balls here. I said, these fish are on these root balls. So if you think that root ball is here, you need to throw up here about uh, 10 feet to the left of that and let this wind and current kind of push that plastic worm right at that root ball. And when you get in the thick of that, that's where the, the big fish are. And I said, right here, two creeks come together, and I'll bet you the biggest fish in the lake is right here. And I said, you came from Indiana to be my guest on the show, so you know I'm going to let you have this cast, right? He said, well, I guess that's right. I said, wrong. And I caught one about nine pounds. <laughs> he that tried every way in the world to beat that fish off, and I, I got it. And so we had all day long. And I kept telling him, I said, there was a basketball goal up there where we put the boats in. I said, when we get through, I said, I'm going to get you on that court, and I'm going to wear you out that basketball. He oh, said, I can't man. wait. Oh, I bet. can't wait. So when we got through, it started lightning. I said, no, we can't get, he said, I ain't oh. cared about no lightning. You get on this court. <laughs> You're going to eat some Wilson. <laughs> Man, I bet. Imagine tr getting to, to play with Larry Bird. That's, that's unbelievable. I, I, I was reading all that stuff and just remembering all the times that, uh, that I've watched the show and I grew up, uh, you know, we'd go out fishing and I, I'd, I'd go up and we'd all be humming. Do -do 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 I mean, that was our deal, man. That would tell you. Yeah. Hey, I tell you, I, I love you, man, and I appreciate you. I appreciate what you've done, but I appreciate more who you are and who you've become and that you're using your platform for the glory of God. And so many people are, are coming into the kingdom. You know, we, we do a lot of things we think are really good in life, but, but there's nothing as a believer we can do that's more important than sharing the greatest news of any generation. And that's that Jesus loves us. He's got a plan for our life. We've got a problem. The problem is sin. And he came to live a perfect life for us. He died a death. We all deserve to die. And then he comes back to life, becoming an all sufficient savior. So when we turn to him, we can live with him forever in eternity. I appreciate you, man. And I appreciate you taking the time to be on this podcast with me. Well, I really appreciate what you do, man. You, you got a great job and you do an awesome job at what you do. And what a privilege it is for you and I both to be an ambassador to the King of Kings. How awesome is that, man? And we are so blessed. We are so, and he is so absolutely deserving. He is worthy of all our praise, man. And to be able to go out and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ 
it'll change the world. And, and you're doing an awesome job and I'm behind you and I really appreciate you. And I, I appreciate this podcast. I hope there's somebody that's interested in fishing that learns there's something a whole lot more important than fishing. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> right, man. I appreciate you folks. I want to thank you for listening this week. Uh, you can hit the subscribe button, that big red subscribe button up there, <laughs> hit the little bell. Our podcast drops every Friday. And we want to thank you for being at the Bass Chaplain Fishing Podcast, the slowest growing podcast in America. We'll tell you, we'll see you later.